Hi everyone, it's Professor Primton, and in this video I'm going to talk about trigonometric graphs. Since the graph of a function gives us a better idea of its behavior, we're going to graph the sine and the cosine functions in this video, along with their transformations. So in this video, we're going to talk about how to determine the amplitude, the period, and the phase shift of the sine and cosine functions, and then how to graph transformations of the sine and cosine functions, including vertical and horizontal shifts, reflections, vertical stretching and shrinking, and horizontal stretching and shrinking. So let's talk about the graphs of the sine and cosine functions. If we're going to graph the sine and the cosine functions, we need to first see that the functions actually repeat their values in a regular fashion. So since the circumference of a unit circle is 2 pi, the terminal point p x comma y is determined by a real number t along the unit circle. So you trace along the unit circle a distance of t radians, either clockwise if the t is negative or counterclockwise if t is positive. And you find out that the terminal point p x comma y for this real number t is also going to be the same terminal point. It's determined by the value of t plus 2 pi. So if you go another revolution of the unit circle counterclockwise 2 pi radians, you'll end up at the same terminal point p x comma y as the real number determined by t. So what this means is that the values of the sine and the cosine function are unchanged if you add an integer multiple of 2 pi radians to the argument of the sine or the cosine function. So in other words, sine of t is equal to the same value as sine of 2 plus 2 pi k, where k is some integer. In other words, if you add in some multiple of 2 pi with the argument of t, then you'll have the same y value from determined from the terminal point, x comma y. And the same thing for cosine cosine of t will also be the same value as cosine of t plus 2 pi k, where k is an integer. So that means if you add some multiple of 2 pi to the argument with t, it will be the same value as cosine of t because the cosine function is the x-coordinate from your terminal point, and the terminal points are the same for the value of t and also the, for the value of t plus 2 pi k. This means that the sine and the cosine functions are periodic according to the following definition. So the definition of a periodic function the function f is called periodic if there is some positive number p such that whenever t is in the domain of the function, and so is t plus p, it's also in the domain of the function, f of t plus p is the same y value or output value as f of t. The smallest such number p for this to happen, where f of t plus p is equal to f of t, the p is called the period of the function. And so how does this relate back to the sine and cosine functions? Well, the theorem says periodic properties of sine and cosine. The functions sine and cosine have a period of 2 pi. That's the smallest positive number before the sine and the cosine functions start repeating values. This means that you have the following properties. Sine of t plus 2 pi will be equal to sine of t. So if you have 2 pi is the period of the function for the sine function, that means any value that you add to t, which is a multiple of 2 pi, you'll have the same output value as sine of t. And the same thing for cosine. Cosine of t plus 2 pi will also be equal to cosine of t. In other words, the smallest number before the cosine function starts repeating the values, output values is 2 pi. And so since the sine and the cosine functions repeat their values, in any interval of 2 pi, we can actually sketch the graph of one complete period over the interval 0 less than or equal to t less than or equal to 2 pi. So we're going to sketch the graphs of the sine and cosine functions. We could try to make a table of values and then use those points to draw the graph. However, we'll have all possible values of t that are real numbers between 0 and 2 pi. That's an infinite number of values for t. We're going to find few other values of sine and cosine in the following table. So this is a table of values for real numbers t, 0 pi over 6, pi over 3, pi over 2, 2 pi over 3, 5 pi over 6 to pi. So this is quadrants 1 and 2 of the unit circle between 0 and pi. And then you also have 7 pi over 6, 4 pi over 3, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 3, 11 pi over 6, and 2 pi. That makes up quadrants 3 and 4 of the unit circle. So remember, the sine function of t, whenever t is equal to 0, was 0. If t is equal to pi over 6, sine function is the y-coordinate of the terminal point determined by the value of t equals pi over 6. So the y value is 1 half of the terminal point. Whenever t is equal to pi over 3, you have sine of pi over 3 is squared 3 over 2. And then if you have t is equal to pi over 2, sine of pi over 2 is 1 because the y value is 1 at that terminal point, 0 comma 1, determined by t equals pi over 2. So this gives you the first quadrant for the sine function. The cosine function, if you recall, it's the x-coordinate as the terminal point determined by the value of t. So if t is equal to 0, remember that we start off at 1 comma 0. So the x-coordinate is 1. So cosine of 0 gives you 1. At cosine of pi over 6, you get squared 3 divided by 2. Cosine of pi over 3 is 1 half. Cosine of pi over 2 was 0. So that's the first quadrant for the cosine function. Now you can repeat the same process 
to find out what are the values of the sine function and the cosine functions for quadrants 2, 3, and 4 as well. So recall that the sine function is the y coordinate of the terminal point p x comma y on the unit circle determined by the real number t. Notice in the first quadrant the y values increase from 0 to 1 as the t values increase from 0 to pi over 2. And then in quadrant 2 notice that the values as t increases from pi over 2 to pi the y values actually decrease because they go from 1 to square root 3 over 2 to 1 half to 0. So the sine function actually decreases from y equals 1 to y equals 0. And you can do the same thing for the cosine function. It looks like the cosine function actually decreases value between t equals 0 and pi over 2, and then the values of cosine actually still decrease between pi over 2 and pi. That actually decreases from 0 to negative 1. So let's start summarizing what do the values of the sine function and the values of the cosine function do in each quadrant, quadrants 1, 2, 3, and 4, for these various values of t between 0 and 2 pi. So from the values in the table, if you have an interval between 0 and pi over 2 for the values of t, notice that the sine function actually increases from 0 to 1, and the cosine function decreases from 1 to 0. So in other words, the sine function is increasing in the first quadrant, and the cosine function is decreasing in the first quadrant between the values of t equals 0 to pi over 2. Now if you're between pi over 2 and pi for the values of t, that would be quadrant 2. If you have pi over 2 to pi for the values of t, the sine function actually decreases from 1 to 0, and the cosine function still decreases from 0 to negative 1. So the sine function is now decreasing for these values of t, and the cosine function is still decreasing for those same values of t. So now let's talk about the third quadrant. The third quadrant would be from t equals pi to t equals 3 pi over 2. So for these values from pi to 3 pi over 2, the sine function decreases from 0 to negative 1, whereas the cosine function starts to increase from negative 1 back up to 0. So the sine function is still decreasing in quadrant 3, whereas the cosine function is now increasing when the values of t are in quadrant 3. So the last interval, or the last quadrant, for t equals 3 pi over 2 to t equals 2 pi, 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi, the sine function will increase from negative 1 to 0 for an output value, whereas the cosine function will increase from output values of 0 to 1. So now the sine function is increasing, and the cosine function is still increasing. So let's start piecing this together to graph the sine function. So the sine function, the output values are the y coordinate of the terminal points. So let's start. At 0, 0 radians, the sine function at t equals 0 is 0. So we start at 0, 0 for the sine function. So since the output value is the y value or the y coordinate of the terminal point for this value t sub 0, then let's start going around the unit circle. At pi over 6, the sine function is 1 half. So the y values are increasing when you go to pi over 6. At t equals pi over 3, the y value is still increasing. Now it's square root 3 divided by 2. And whenever t is equal to pi over 2, the sine function is 1 because the y coordinate for the terminal point at pi over 2 is 0, 1. So the y coordinate is 1. So you increase until you get to t equals pi over 2. And so that's what we found out with the table. The sine functions are increasing an output value from 0 to 1 between 0 and pi over 2. So it hits its highest point at t equals pi over 2. And then we find out the sine function starts to decrease between t equals pi over 2 and pi. So now the values are decreasing in value until you get from a y value of 1 to a y value of 0 for the sine function whenever t is equal to pi. So t equals pi, that is y equals 0 for the sine function. And now in quadrant 3, if t is equal to pi to 3 pi over 2, the y values decrease from 0 to negative 1. So we're going to decrease until we get to 3 pi over 2, the y value is negative 1 for the sine function. And then in quadrant 4, the y values increase from negative 1 to 0, so the graph will start to increase until you get to 2 pi. And then we know the period of sine function is 2 pi. So we're now we're back at 2 pi comma 0, and now the graph will start repeat itself over the same values every 2 pi radians. So there's a couple properties about this graph that you can notice. If the function is y equals sine of t, or f of t equals sine of t, the sine function is actually an odd function. In other words, the graph is symmetric with respect to the origin. Sine of negative t is equal to the opposite of sine of t. That's what it means for a function to be an odd function. If you replace the t with a negative t, and it becomes the opposite of the entire function, that's an odd function. So the function y equals sine of t is symmetric with respect to the origin. And you can see that with the graph. It looks like the graph is symmetric with respect to the origin for this graph of y equals sine of t. Now using the fact that the y equals sine of t is actually a periodic function, where the period of sine is 2 pi, we actually can complete the graph by continuing the same pattern that we just noticed. 
from left to right. Every successive interval between 0 and 2 pi, or 2 pi to 4 pi, 4 pi to 6 pi, and so on, every period of 2 pi, the graph will repeat the same values. Notice the graph will increase to y equals 1, then the graph will decrease to y equals negative 1, and then it'll start to increase back to 0, and then it'll repeat itself again and again. Every period of 2 pi. So the graph that we just completed is here, between 0 and 2 pi, that's the sine function. But now notice that you can actually repeat the values between 2 pi and 4 pi, and it'll also be the same graph between 4 pi and 6 pi, or the same graph between negative 2 pi and 0 as well. The sine function is periodic, and the period is 2 pi. So as long as you know the graph between 0 and 2 pi, you actually know the entire graph of the sine function. Well now, if you approach this the same way, in terms of graphing the cosine function, then you notice that the cosine function will actually be this graph. The y values start at y equals 1 whenever the t was equal to 0, and the graph is decreasing over quadrant 1 until you get to pi over 2, the y value is 0, and then the graph is still decreasing until you get to t equals pi, the y value is now negative 1, and now after t equals pi in quadrant 3, the graph of the cosine function will start to increase until you get to t equals 3 pi over 2, where the cosine function is 0, and then in quadrant 4, the graph will still be increasing until you get a y value of 1 again at t equals 2 pi. And since the cosine function is also periodic with a period of 2 pi, the graph between 0 and 2 pi will now repeat itself. We will repeat the values between 2 pi and 4 pi. So the graph will decrease between 2 pi and 5 pi over 2. It'll still be decreasing from 5 pi over 2 to 3 pi. It'll start to increase from 3 pi to 7 pi over 2. And then it'll be increasing again until you get to 4 pi or 8 pi over 2. And so notice, it's the same pattern as 0 to 2 pi as it is from 2 pi to 4 pi. Or again, it'd be the same pattern between negative 2 pi and 0 as it is between 0 and 2 pi. Because the period of the cosine function is 2 pi. Notice that the output values for the cosine function are actually the x-coordinate or the x-value of the terminal point determined by the value of t. So even though they're the x-values or x-coordinates, these are the output values of your cosine function. You input t into the cosine function, you output x-coordinates from your terminal point. So if y equals cosine of t, or g of t equals cosine of t, notice that the graph is actually symmetric with respect to the y-axis. That means that the cosine function is actually an even function. So that means cosine of the opposite of t, so if you replace the t with an opposite of t inside the cosine function, it actually takes the function and remains the same. So cosine of negative t is equal to cosine of positive t. That means the graph is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. Or in other words, the cosine function is actually an even function. So in addition to the period being 2 pi for both cosine and sine, you actually can use the properties of symmetry to actually help you graph as well. Now we're going to use this information to graph the sine and cosine functions for t between 0 and 2 pi. So let's talk about graphs of transformations of the sine and the cosine function. We're going to consider the graphs of functions that are transformations of either sine or the cosine function. And the transformations that we talked about earlier are actually very useful and are very important to understand the applications to physical situations such as harmonic motion. So in other words, if you have wave curves, those can be modeled by sine and cosine functions. So since we want to graph the trigonometric functions in the rectangular coordinate system, so rather than using t as an input value or using theta as an input value, most of the time when actually you graph the sine or the cosine function, you replace the input variable being x, and the output variable will now be y. So you use the traditional symbols x and y. The x stands for the independent variable, and the y will stand for the dependent variable or the output variable. So in other words, y equals sine of theta will now be replaced with y equals sine of x. That way we can actually input x values and output y values. And same thing for y equals cosine of theta. It'll now be y equals cosine of x. y equals tangent of theta will now be y equals tangent of x. And same thing for the reciprocal functions as well. That's just going to help us when we graph. So let's take a look at example one. Transformations of trigonometric graphs. Starting with the graph of the basic trigonometric function, we're going to be either graphing the sine function or the cosine function and transformations of those. Describe the transformations used to obtain the graph of f of x, then graph the function. So number one, the function that we're going to graph is f of x equals 4 plus cosine of x. So it looks like we're trying to describe this in terms of y equals cosine of x as the basic trigonometric function. So starting with the basic trigonometric function y equals cosine of x, it looks like the transformations to obtain this graph of f of x, which is 4 plus cosine of x, it looks like the transformation is a vertical shift up 4 units. Because you're taking the cosine function, 
and you're adding 4. That's going to affect the y values or the output values. So starting with the graph of y equals cosine of x, we have this between 0 and 2 pi graphed. Notice that the graph starts at 0, 1. It'll decrease until pi over 2, 0. It'll cross the x-axis. It'll continue to decrease until you get to pi, negative 1. Then the graph will start increasing for cosine until you get to 3 pi over 2. That'll cross the x-axis because the y value is 0. The graph will still increase until you get to 2 pi and the y value is 1. And now the graph will just repeat itself as it did between 0, 1 and 2 pi, 1. It will just repeat the same pattern over and over because the period is 2 pi. Well, if the entire graph is shifted up 4 units to graph f of x, we just shift every single point up 4 units. So it's going to affect the y values. So we're going to start instead of at 0, 1, we're going to start at 0, 5. Instead of pi over 2, 0, now it will be pi over 2, 4. Pi, 1 will now be a pi, 3. 3 pi over 2, 0 will now be 3 pi over 2, 4. And then 2 pi, 1 will now be at 2 pi, 5. And again, the period of this function is 2 pi. So the graph will repeat its pattern every 2 pi radians. So let's take a look at number 2. This time we're going to graph the function g of x, which is the opposite of cosine of x. So starting with the basic trigonometric function, y equals cosine of x, it looks like the transformation to obtain the graph of g of x, which is the opposite of cosine of x, it looks like the cosine function has been multiplied by negative 1. That means the y values are going to be multiplied by negative 1, and that means the transformation is a reflection about the x-axis or across the x-axis. So again, starting with the graph of the cosine function, it starts at 0, 1. The graph will decrease until you get to pi, negative 1. Then the graph will increase until you get to 2 pi, positive 1. And then the graph will just repeat the pattern every 2 pi radians because the period of cosine is 2 pi. If we want to graph the function g of x, it's a reflection across the x-axis. That means all the y-coordinates are going to be multiplied by negative 1. So instead of 0, 1, it's going to now start at 0, negative 1. At pi over 2, comma 0, that's still going to be pi over 2, comma 0. Pi, comma negative 1 will now be pi, comma positive 1. 3 pi over 2, comma 0 will still be 3 pi over 2, comma 0. And then 2 pi, comma 1 will now be reflected across the x-axis to be 2 pi, comma negative 1. And so this is the graph that's dotted or dashed. That's the graph of y equals the opposite of cosine of x. It's a reflection across the x-axis. And its period is also 2 pi. So that means that the graph will actually repeat the pattern every 2 pi radians. So in the previous example, we've seen transformations such as vertical shifts up or down. And we also talked about reflections about the x-axis. We're going to also discuss transformations such as vertical and horizontal stretches and shrinks. And also horizontal shifts of basic trigonometric functions. So let's say we want to graph the function f of x equals 2 times sine of x. By starting with the graph of the sine function, and you multiply the entire function by 2, that means you're going to multiply all the y-coordinates by 2. So you take all the y-coordinates for every single point that's on the graph of y equals sine of x, and you multiply by 2. Well, that's going to have the effect of vertically stretching the graph of y equals sine of x by a factor of 2. Because we're multiplying the entire function by 2, that is multiplying all the y values by 2, it's going to stretch the graph away from the x-axis. So that's called a vertical stretch by a factor of 2. And so the graph that's in blue is the sine function. That's y equals sine of x. It starts at 0, 0. It increases until you get to pi over 2, 1. Then it decreases to pi, 0. It decreases again until 3 pi over 2, negative 1. And then it will increase until you get to 2 pi, 0 again. Well, if you multiply all the y values by 2, Notice what happens to the y values. At 0, 0, it's still going to be 0, 0. At pi over 2, 1, it's now going to be pi over 2, 2 for a y value because the y value has been multiplied by 2. At pi, the y value was 0. Well, the y value is still 0 because 2 times 0 is 0. At 3 pi over 2, it was negative 1. So now 3 pi over 2, it'll be y value of negative 2. And then at 2 pi, the y value is 0 it'll still be 2 pi, 0. And so it looks like if you repeat this pattern between 0 and 2 pi, the graph will have a period of 2 pi, and the graph will look like it's been stretched by a factor of 2 vertically, away from the x-axis. However, let's say you want to graph y equals 1 half sine of x. What would be the transformation that you would occur if you multiplied each of the y-coordinates by 1 half, like this function? y equals 1 half sine of x will take the function y equals sine of x, and you multiply all the y values by one half. What is that transformation? That's a vertical shrink by a factor of a half because you're being multiplied by a number that's less than one. That's called a vertical shrink by a factor of that number. So we're being multiplied by one half. That's a vertical shrink by a factor of one half. So zero comma zero is still gonna be zero zero for this graph of y equals one half sine of x. At pi over two, the y value was one. So if you multiply the y value by one half, it'll be pi over two comma one half. 
at pi, the y value was 0, so it will still be pi comma 0. Then at 3 pi over 2, the y value was negative 1 for the sine function. Well, if you multiply by a half, that will make it negative 1 half. So it will be 3 pi over 2 comma negative 1 half. And so it looks like if you look at the graph between 0 and 2 pi, it will repeat itself every 2 pi radians. It looks like the graph has been pushed towards the x-axis. That is a vertical shrink by a factor of 1 half. So in general, the functions y equals a times sine of x, or y equals a times cosine of x, the number, the absolute value of a, is called the amplitude, and is the largest value that the trigonometric function actually attains. So the graph of y equals a sine of x for various values of a are shown in the figure below. So notice that the graph that's in blue again, that's y equals sine of x. If you multiply all the y values by 3, and you get y equals 3 times sine of x, that's going to be a vertical stretch by a factor of 3. The amplitude of y equals 3 times sine of x is the number a, the absolute value of 3, which is 3. So the amplitude of this graph, y equals 3 times sine of x, it's 3. On the other hand, let's say you have the graph y equals 1 half sine of x. That's this graph that's in black. It looks like it's a vertical shrink by a factor of 1 half because the graph has been pushed towards the x-axis. The y values have been multiplied by 1 half it looks like the largest value that the graph obtains is y value of 1 half. So the amplitude of y equals 1 half sine of x is the value a. It's the absolute value of 1 half, the number that's being multiplied by the sine function. So 1 half is the amplitude of the graph y equals 1 half sine of x. And the graph y equals negative 2 sine of x, that is a reflection across the x-axis or about the x-axis. And it also looks like you're multiplying the y values by 2. So it's a vertical stretch by a factor of 2 and also a reflection about the x-axis. Well, what's its amplitude? Its amplitude would be the number a, which is the absolute value of negative 2. So the absolute value of negative 2 is positive 2. So the amplitude of y equals negative 2 sine of x is 2. So how does the amplitude help us when we actually want to graph the sine function or the cosine function? The range of the trigonometric function, y equals a sine of x, or y equals a cosine of x, the range of those two graphs looks like the y values will range between negative a and positive a because the amplitude is a. The largest value that the graph will attain will be positive a, and the smallest y value that the graph will attain will be the opposite of a, or negative a. So that means the range is determined by the amplitude of the trigonometric function. So let's look at example two. Transformations of trigonometric graphs. Starting with the graph of the basic trigonometric function, describe the transformations used to obtain the graph of f of x, then graph the function. So number one, we're going to graph the function f of x is equal to negative four times sine of the opposite of x. So if you want to start with the basic trigonometric function, it looks like we're going to start with the sine function. y equals sine of x. The transformations that's needed to obtain the graph of f of x looks like it's going to be a reflection across the x-axis because it looks like you're multiplying by a negative number for the y values, and so it would be a reflection across the x-axis. You are replacing x with a negative x inside the sine function, so that's a reflection about the y-axis, and it looks like there's also going to be a vertical stretch by a factor of 4 because you're multiplying the y values by 4. So it's going to be a reflection about the x-axis, a reflection about the y-axis, and also a vertical stretch by a factor of 4. So if you have the graph of y equals sine of x, notice that the graph will start at 0 comma 0. It increases to pi over 2 comma 1. Then the graph decreases to pi comma 0. It still decreases to 3 pi over 2 comma negative 1. And then the graph will increase to 2 pi comma 0. And then it just repeats the same pattern because the period of the sine function is 2 pi. Well, now the transformation is taken to effect if we want to graph the function f of x. So the point 0 comma 0 is still going to be 0 comma 0. A reflection across the x-axis and also the y-axis will have no effect. And the y values being multiplied by 4 will have no effect as well. So the graph of our function f of x will also pass through 0 comma 0. So now let's see what happens to the point pi over 2 comma 1. So a reflection about the x-axis will make it pi over 2 negative 1. A reflection across the y-axis will make it negative pi over 2 comma negative 1. And now if you multiply the y values by 4, it will become negative pi over 2 comma negative 4. So pi over 2 comma 1, the transformations, reflection about the x-axis, reflection about the y-axis, and a vertical stretch by a factor of 4, now you're going to have a point at negative pi over 2 comma negative 4. Let's take a look at pi comma 0. If you take pi comma 0 and you reflect it across the x-axis, it's going to stay the same. It'll stay pi comma 0. If you reflect across the y-axis, now it will be negative pi comma 0. And if you multiply the y values by 4, it will stay negative pi comma 0. So the graph will pass through negative pi comma 0. So it looks like the graph will go from negative pi comma 0 
to negative pi over 2 comma negative 4, and then it has to go back through 0 comma 0. And since the sine function is an odd function, we're going to have symmetry with respect to the origin. So the graph will increase until you get to the point pi over 2 comma 4, then the graph will decrease until you get to pi comma 0, they'll continue to decrease until you get 3 pi over 2 comma negative 4, and then it'll increase until you get back to 2 pi comma 0. And since the period of this function is 2 pi, it will repeat that pattern every 2 pi radians. And so this is the graph of f of x, which is equal to negative 4 sine of the opposite of x. Or notice, if you take f of x, which is negative 4 sine of the opposite of x, and you use the property about the sine function being an odd function, you actually can simplify this function. You have negative 4 times sine of the opposite of x is the opposite of the sine function of positive x because it's an odd function. So negative 4 times negative sine of x becomes 4 sine of x. So in other words, what's the effect of a reflection across the x-axis, a reflection across the y-axis, and also a vertical stretch by a factor of 4? Well, it looks like it's the same thing as a vertical stretch by a factor of 4 with the original function y equals sine of x. So let's finish up this video with one more. Number two, we're going to graph the function g of x, which is equal to 2 times cosine of the opposite of x. So it looks like if you start with a basic trigonometric function, y equals cosine of x, it looks like you replace the x with a negative x inside the cosine function. That's going to be a reflection about the y-axis. And it looks like you're also multiplying the function by 2. That is a vertical stretch by a factor of 2. So this time we're going to start with the basic function y equals cosine of x. So that starts at 0, 1, and it will decrease until pi over 2, 0. It still decreases until you get to pi, negative 1. Then the graph starts to increase until you get to 3 pi over 2, 0. And then the graph will continue to increase until you get to 2 pi, 1. And then the graph just repeats the same pattern after every 2 pi radians, because that's the period of the cosine function. Well, if you have a reflection about the y-axis and also a vertical stretch by a factor of 2, let's see what happens to these points. 0, 1. If you reflect across the y-axis, it will stay the same. It will stay 0, 1. But if you multiply the entire function by 2, that's a vertical stretch by a factor of 2. So now the point will be at 0, 2 for our graph of g of x. At pi over 2, 0, if you reflect across the y-axis, now it will be at negative pi over 2, 0. And if you multiply the y value by 2, it will stay negative pi over 2, 0. So our graph will go through negative pi over 2, 0 and 0, 2. And since we know that the cosine function is an even function, we know it will be symmetric with respect to the y-axis. So the graph will now decrease until you get to pi over 2, comma 0. It will continue to decrease until you get to pi, comma negative 2. Then it will increase until you get to 3 pi over 2, comma 0. Continue to increase until you get to 2 pi, comma 2. And since the period of the cosine function is 2 pi radians, the graph will have the same pattern every 2 pi radians. So what is the effect of having a reflection about the y-axis and also a vertical stretch by a factor of 2 with the cosine function? Well, if the function is 2 times cosine of the opposite of x, remember that the cosine function is an even function. So cosine of the opposite of x is cosine of positive x because it's symmetric with respect to the y-axis already. So that means that g of x can be simplified to 2 times cosine of x. So that means that if you want to start with the cosine function and graph g of x, it's really just a vertical stretch by a factor of 2. So this is a good place to stop our video. Now we talked about how to determine the amplitude, the period, and the phase shift of the sine and cosine functions. We also talked about how to use graphs of transformations of the sine and cosine function, including vertical and horizontal shifts, reflections, vertical stretching and shrinking, and also horizontal stretching and shrinking. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we finish up our discussion on graphing the sine and the cosine functions.